It's my nerd world, and welcome to it, Depeche Mode, the podcast. This week, how do you celebrate Depeche Mode without Depeche Mode? Inflection is important when trying to ask that question. I'll explain. Sounds of the Universe, 12-inch singles gets a release date. I have some details on that. Listener feedback and another fan spotlight. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. I think I can officially say that Memento Mori, for this Depeche Mode fan, that would be me, John Justice, I'm your host, and thank you for checking out another episode. Uh, Memento Mori is... Up there with what I call the sort of the the trinity of of albums that can shift back and forth, but specifically your music for the masses, your violator, your songs of faith and devotion. I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but I really am still consistently listening to Memento Mori in much the same way that I did those albums back in that prime Depeche Mode time of my life, which relates to the question I want to ask and hopefully get a lot of feedback uh, from you uh, the, the, uh, in, the coming, in the coming week. But as I've said, and I don't want to keep repeating myself, there's just something special about this, this album and this time of being a Depeche Mode fan. And it's been so much fun. While there hasn't been a lot of news, I do have the, uh, the next round of 12-inch singles uh, getting a release date with Sounds of the Universe. But um, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been fun just... Watching the tour roll along, looking at the set list, even though I know we're, we just have two set lists with the change of songs, a few songs that get changed. There's nothing new, but reading the reviews from different places around the world where the band is performing, continuing to follow individuals and their commentary on social networking, whether it's Instagram or, or Twitter. Um, I said it before, I'll say it again, this time, this Depeche Mode time we're in right now... Um, is the closest to resembling that Depeche Mode time of the past when it really did dominate my life before family and children around those albums in 1988, 1990, and uh, and 93. So... Uh, before I get to my question this week, I do want to give you just a uh, a bit of news. The one item that dropped um, earlier this week, got a notification on my phone of an Instagram story, only to uh, find out that, oh, we have a new round of 12-inch singles getting a release date. Depeche Mode, Sounds of the Universe, seven-record box set. Box set. Can't speak today. Box set. Uh, Depeche Mode will continue, looking at an article here, uh, with their 12-inch singles box sets with a seven-record package devoted to their 2009 album, Sounds of the Universe. As with uh, as with some of the more recent boxes, some of these 12-inch records, three of them to be precise, are newly compiled from CD singles of the day and feature B-sides and various mixes. Uh, the singles from this album were Wrong, Peace, and the double A-side of Fragile Tension, Hold to Feed. Uh, this will be released on August 4th via Sony Music. And uh, you can go and pre-order in a number of uh, different locations. Now, I don't have any of these uh, of these box sets. Um, in terms of physical releases for the band, uh, I've really been focusing over the course of the past, you know, I guess two, two decades, on the album releases solely, and not I have not been collecting the uh, the single box sets. I did have a question though for those because one thing that I have been considering getting my hands on would be the. Video, the last video collection that came out, probably the most comprehensive one that's been released. I have a couple of different versions of the singles release on DVD, including the deluxe set. Um, most of the videos are all available online, and I had uh, been toying with the idea of going and getting the the most recent video. I think it's the collection, right? The Depeche Mode collection. Uh, if you've uh, if you own that, I'd be curious to get your thoughts if it's worth having it. If you already have the singles release, um, if it's worth having this extra release. I know when it, when it came out, I remember reading that there was some bit of criticism over the quality of the content of the videos on the uh, 
on the DVD, so I'd be interested to get your thoughts. Also, I did I did a little digging on this. Couldn't find a whole lot of information. There was a point when the band was releasing after Spirit, I believe, a complete Depeche Mode box set of like everything. I went online and I found a couple places where it showed the images of it, but I wasn't 100% sure whether or not it was actually available for for purchase. Just this one cube box that had everything in it. So I'd be interested um, if anybody actually got their hands on that and um, whether or not it was you know worth the, the purchase. Again, considering that most of us have all the albums in some way, shape, or form, and certainly on streaming if you are not... Uh, collectors of the uh, the physical uh, releases. As always, you can email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, uh, or leave a comment up on YouTube if you happen to be uh, watching there. All right, before we get to listener feedback this week, again, not a, not a lot of news going on. Um, this is inspired by my, uh, my friend uh, Matt. He had uh, messaged me uh, the other day, um, with regard to the movie Sing Street, which I've talked about on the show uh, before. Fantastic film. And it got me thinking, how do you celebrate Depeche Mode without Depeche Mode? Again, going back to that time period, um, and specifically the years of, say, 87, 88 through 93, 94. So the beginning of the promotion around Music for the Masses and ending with the end of the exotic tour for uh, devotional that those core years, which is amazing to think of about the relatively short period of time that I'm actually looking at between say 88 and 93. Um, But those years were the years of Depeche Mode for me as a fan Um, dating, uh, going to concerts with friends. The years kind of ran into each other in terms of Depeche Mode releases. So there was this constant flow of Depeche Mode through my life during those years. And as time progresses, the dates between releases of the albums gets longer. You, you know, you get older, career and family and children all comes into play. So Depeche Mode doesn't dominate our lives the way that it did back then. And this speaks to what I was talking about earlier with regard to this particular time period and being surrounded by so much Depeche Mode on a constant basis really is bringing me back to those days. So how do you go about now celebrating Depeche Mode without Depeche Mode? If you're not watching videos or listening to the music, is there other ways or are there other ways that bring about the same sort of buzz, uh, nostalgia, um, appreciation of Depeche Mode that aren't directly tied to Depeche Mode. For me, it really comes around to movies. Movies that featured Depeche Mode, for those that remember Say Anything, had um, in the film and on the soundtrack, they included the live version from 101 of uh, Stripped uh, and other films that had been released during this time period. I've actually gone back and uh, looked at the movie releases on Wikipedia and specifically found films that I'm fans of that were released around the releases of Music for the Masses, Violator, and um, Songs of Faith and Devotion, also around the tour as well. I get big into nostalgia and... um, Songs attached to certain feelings really, really grab hold for me. So to watch a film from a particular time period, even though it may not be at all related to Depeche Mode, it takes me back to that time. A really odd one would be um, The Hunt for Red October specifically. This was based off of the Tom Clancy novel starring Sean Connery, uh, directed uh, by... Uh, McTiernan, fantastic film, huge fan of the movie, and I remember seeing it right around the time when Violator came out. Uh, That book and that film was actually also a part of my inspiration when I wrote my science fiction Embark series. I just, I love the technical aspect of what Tom Clancy brought to his novels, um, along with the the thriller aspect of the uh, of the story. But going and watching a movie like Hunt for Red October, 
just takes me back to that period of time, even though it's not attached to Depeche Mode. Um, there's a host of other films, um, True Romance being another one that really reminds me of that time period around songs of, uh, of faith and devotion. And then you have your more modern day films that I lean on that are music related when I'm in a a place of Depeche Mode sort of dominating my my days in terms of music. A song like or a, a movie like Sing Street I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Begin Again. Uh, with Kira Knightley and uh, Mark Ruffalo is fantastic. Um, the Bohemian Rhapsody is another one that's fantastic. So I'm curious if you go out of your way to sort of celebrate Depeche Mode without Depeche Mode. Maybe a little bit off the wall. However, I, I just we Depeche Mode fans seem to really align in a lot of ways. And every time I think that I sort of stepped beyond you know, what somebody else goes and does, I get emails from people going, no, I do exactly the same thing. So what do you do? Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Or uh, again, leave a comment up on YouTube if you happen to be listening and watching there. All right, let's get into your listener feedback this week. And first we hear from friend of the show, Chad. You're all friends of the show, by the way. So just want to let you know, if I don't add the friend of the show, um, you're all included. So, but Chad writes, uh, what is wrong with Depeche Mode's record company? I don't understand what they are doing with these singles. Speaking specifically to the album singles. The album and concert are selling well, and they had hit. They had a hit with Ghosts Again. So why are they not putting any effort in here? Ghosts Again obviously was a single. It had a video on a Spotify release, charted well, and had remixes. Um, this... Sh- uh, let me get let me stop here real quick. Oh, um, my cosmos is mine. Excuse me, my cosmos is mine. Was kind of released shows on Spotify as a single with Ghosts Again as the second track, no video, and the wiki page says it wasn't a single, just a promo. Yeah, I believe that's what they. I forgot what they called a like a look single, an advanced look single or something to this effect. Um, wagging tongue, a video was released and nothing else. The video clip doesn't even play. When the Spotify song is played, it's not listed on Spotify or Wiki as a single. Memento Mori has become one of my all-time faves. Is it too much to ask for singles, each with remixes and maybe an album track as a B-side? I'm dying for People Are Good, Me Too, Never Let Me Go single and mixes, but I'm starting to give up that this album is going to have one single. The only thing... um, And thanks, uh, Chad, uh, as always. The only thing that I can speculate is that there just is not a return of investment. That's the only thing that I can think of in terms of producing enough physical copies in the world that we live in and life in general to uh, um, to make it worthwhile to produce physical singles or to go out and find remixes for those particular um, albums. It's just it's a very, very different time in terms of how we consume our music. And while you listening to a podcast like this are probably way more inclined to go out and purchase a physical release, I imagine that there are millions of other fans that are out there that probably are completely satisfied just having the streaming versions on their phone, in which case printing up a lot of physical copies might be more difficult. Now, the specialty releases, like the singles box sets, like I mentioned a moment ago, of of, of Sounds of the Universe, which is an album that I absolutely love, by the way. I meant to get into that, but absolutely love that album. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that in the future when it actually gets um, written, released. Um, but with those, with those box sets, you know, they already have a really good understanding of how many they're going to sell, and they can print those accordingly without wasting the budget. Um, Johannes Jorgensen writes, if I was to choose one additional track from Memento Mori to hear at the concert, I'm leaning more and more towards Never Let Me Go. It's a high intensity track that would sound great live as opposed to some other suggestions that are great album tracks, but lack the energy and tempo needed in a live show. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I would tend to agree. I would love to see the whole album done live. I don't need to. I had my idea of a little campaign of more Memento Mori live. It didn't really take off. And I was kind of thinking that might have been the case. But you never know. You know, you got to you got to try. Right. Um, Melissa writes. And if I said that, um, if I pronounced that 
uh, wrong, I apologize. Uh, Malissa is just spelled M-A-L-Y-S-S-A. I had to give up watching the Primavera live stream replay. So frustrating. As an editor, I was like, what the hell are you doing? It's like a kid got their first editing slash effects technology and was just pushing the buttons to see what they do. I wonder if there was a reason for all the blackouts. I haven't looked into that. Can't understand why it would stay on the black screen when In Your Room kicks in. It's such an awesome moment. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that camera went out and perhaps they didn't realize that camera went out. But thank you for the um, for the message. And uh, that's a really good question because I don't know either. Pete from Philly writes, after leaving a comment on at MyNerdWorld.net, which doesn't happen very often, so I just wanted to say, Pete, thank you for using the website to leave a message. So I don't go there nearly as often as I should. It's there mostly for my science fiction series, but I do I need to update it. I do post the videos and the podcasts up there as well, although I'm behind a couple of weeks. John, I just wanted to reach out and say how much I've been enjoying your podcast. I've been a Depeche Mode fan since Music for the Masses came out in 87. I always look forward to new music from our favorite band. And I have to admit, I was really worried that Spirit would be their last effort. When Fletcher passed away last year, I really thought this could be the end of the band. Flash forward a year, and we have a new excellent album, probably the best since Ultra. And we have a massive world tour underway. All seems right in the world with the boys back in action. Just wanted to say how things have come full circle for me and how special it's been. I have a 17-year-old son who's gotten into Depeche Mode, and he loves them as much as I do. This album cycle has been extra special because of that. When we first listened to the album together, it was surreal for me to be experiencing that with my son. Yeah, I tried to get my sons into the album or into Depeche Mode, and they just, they never, they never, they never bought into it. Um, But that's fine, and I can absolutely understand why that would be special for you. We're going to see them in October in Philly. This will be my 12th DM show and my son's first. Wow. Can't tell you how excited I am to be able to share that experience with my son. This shows you how special Depeche Mode is and how timeless their music is. I wanted to share that with you and the listeners. Keep up the great work. Thanks, John. Uh, Thank you, Pete. And uh, that really is special. And thank you for sharing that uh, with us. We really do do appreciate it. Um, Leah Raffae in Ontario, Canada writes... I recently discovered your DM podcast with the release of Memento Mori, and I'm loving it. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. I'm writing to comment on the recent fan spotlight of Danielle of Montreal. It resonated with me because I, too, had let my DM fly under the radar for years. Lost all but two of my CDs throughout moves, but have recently started collecting DM vinyl. I'm also 51 years old and saw DM for the first time in Toronto, Canada in April. My flame for DM and Dave, like Danielle's, was reignited now forever. I should have known something was still in my heart for them when I made a point to watch them be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2020. I was also touched which with Fletch's passing. DM brings me so much happiness and joy when I listen. I want to thank you for the awesome podcast. I'm also sort of new to podcast, but I make time for yours. Um, don't use mine as the gauge. There's a lot better podcasts out there. <laughs> so I'm glad you're enjoying mine. Cheers to a fellow DM devotee, uh, Daniel Monet, and yourself. A DM forever. Uh, have a great day, Leah Raffae. Uh, thank you, uh, Leah, for that. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I hate for my podcast to be the first foray into podcasts. Holy cow. All right. Michael Henry writes, uh, uh, as you always get the latest news, I love your podcast. I'm a devotee from um, Ma- Mauritius. Marit- okay, hold on a second. I believe it's Mauritius. I had never heard of Mauritius, and I'm just looking online. Let's pause the podcast for a moment. African island country in the Indian Ocean. It is incredible. The places where people who have been finding this podcast, Michael, are from. That's amazing. Uh, Anyway, so uh, I want to know if you have any news, if Spirit and Memento Mori will will, uh, be released in 5.1 in the uh, in the future. I have not um, heard anything. Uh, I will say that I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that I would love for both of those albums to be released in 5.1. Um, regardless of your feelings towards a spirit, which with the release of Memento Mori actually complements it really well. It's an interesting listen between the two records, and I think that spirit actually benefits from how powerful Memento Mori is. That being said, the production work on both those albums um, rivals 
uh, almost everything from you know Ultra on in in my opinion. Um, I just think the production work of James Ford, uh, and certainly with with Marta Solongni on Memento Mori, but James Ford also on Spirit is just just absolutely top notch. But I have not uh, heard anything with regard to a five point one uh, release. But thank you, and I hope I didn't uh, butcher your country's name too harshly. Uh, but again, it's amazing to hear from everybody all over the world. Uh, Tanya Ham writes, "Love the fan spotlight." feels so connected to her story as it mirrors my own as well as many others always looking forward to your show thank you tanya i uh, appreciate that all right and speaking of uh fan spotlight let's go ahead and get to one for this week and i have a lot of these that i'll finally start getting to in future podcasts so if you've emailed me lengthy stories before Trust me when I say that I have all of them, and I do hope to get through all of them. This particular fan spotlight comes from Philip Finch, here from Leeds in the UK. My late friend Lee, sadly lost before his time, got me into Depeche Mode in early 1990. We used to walk to high school together and had both previously been huge Queen fans, whose albums and works we discovered at length each day. Lee suddenly started talking about this band Depeche Mode. With his, with his enthusiasm building for them over a period of a few months leading into 1990, sometimes bringing to life songs which he would sing out loud on our many walks to and from that school. I had initially been reluctant to engage, attempting to move the focus of our musical discussion back towards Freddie and the boys from Queen, but I had privately, I had to privately confess some of the words of the Depeche Mode songs Lee would sing had me intrigued and growing in curiosity. He used to major, um, he used to major on a question of time and shake the disease, and I found myself relating to the words and the style of the songs. Eventually, made, uh, Lee made me a tape to listen to, which I can remember uh, majored on tracks from Music for the Masses and Black Celebration. And I suddenly got it. I was hooked. And what a time to get the DM bug. In the early months of 1990 and the release of Enjoy the Silence and The Mighty Violator that year, total devotion to Depeche Mode followed. I've seen them on every subsequent tour, enjoying a number of shows with Lee over the years, and I've hugely enjoyed pretty much every album and tour until present date, which brings me to the the arrival of the exceptional Memento Mori. For me, the new album is a triumph. It feels like Depeche Mode have come home. The songs are very strong indeed, and the synth-driven yet cleaner, sparser-sounding atmosphere has a comparison to Violator, which has also brought me full circle back to the time when my friend Lee got me into them 33 years ago. Speaking to the campaign of More Memento Mori Live, it's such a strong album, I'd love to see tracks like Before We Drown, People Are Good, My Favorite Stranger, which is now being performed live, on balance, while tracks such as A Pain That I'm Used To, Sister of Night, and Wrong are great tracks, I'd opt for a wider Memento Mori listing if this was at all possible. It would be a fitting celebration of such a powerful and brilliant album. I sense that the list that's been presented on the warm-up shows will not change potentially at all, and as we know, there's just been a few changes in the tour, especially when they're playing uh, two nights in one location. Um, But if this is the case, hey, it's still Depeche Mode performing what seems to be a very strong show on the back of a really strong album, and I'll take that any time. But we can dream. Thanks for the great podcast. Keep them coming. Take care, and a big shout-out to all the amazing fans around the world listening to this show. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. Sorry I had to keep it kind of short. We'll get to uh, more listener feedback this week. Life gets in the way sometimes. If you want to support my nerd world and you like to read science fiction, I hope you'll go and check out my science fiction space opera series, Embark. Set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture, inspired in part by Depeche Mode, Life in the so-called space age set in the future. The world we live in and life in general. Depeche Mode plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story. And the main character himself is a massive Depeche Mode fan at a time when the music of the 80s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters of the story. They feature references to Depeche Mode, both direct and indirect, while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. If you like your sci-fi to be epic, filled with some romance and action, Embark is perfect for you. Written for adults, but great for all ages, 11+. plus. 
Buy Embark Book One today. Seven books in all in the series, available in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook on Amazon.com, Embark, John J. O. and Justice, or MyNerdWorld.net. All right, I'm done hawking my books. Have yourself a uh, fantastic week. Look forward to hearing from you wherever you are (laughs) in the East Indian Ocean. (laughs) Wherever you are, I hope you're happy, you're healthy, and you were safe. Talk to you next week. Bye. Hello, this is Martin Paul. Hello, hi, this is Dave Dorham. Fresh Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd.